Hi, if you've seen my Eurorack videos, you've seen plats from mutable instruments in many of them. It's a very flexible module with 16 different sound engines and three control knobs for each of the engines. In Microfreak, Arturia have taken seven of the 16 engines from Platts. They can do that because Mutable have generously made their code open source and added five of their own, giving you four voices of them. So basically four copies of the concept of this module wrapped in a full synth with an extensive mod matrix, an analog SEM filter, a rather innovative sequencer and arpeggiator, and this touch surface controller. And probably the most amazing thing they've done is price the whole thing at around 300 euros or dollars, which is quite an interesting price point. In this video, I'll go over all of these things, including the sound engines in depth. But before I do, I want to address this thing. The fact that it says paraphonic and not polyphonic. Like I said before, there are four copies of Microfreak's engines in here each with its own separate VCA. So essentially, if we ignore the filter for a second or treat the filter like an overall effect, Microfreak is a true four voice polyphonic synth, just like synths with no filter at all, like say the DX7 are polyphonic without a filter. Now, don't get me wrong, a filter is a really nice way to control the harmonics of a sound, but with a variety of synth engines in here, there are plenty of ways to increase and reduce harmonics on a per voice basis in a whole bunch of ways, without ever touching the filter. Okay, let's take a top level view of the panel and then we'll dive in. Overall, Microfreak is really quite small, portable and lightweight, coming in at around 2.5 pounds or around one kilo. The oscillator control section has three control knobs, sort of like the three controls on plats, and a fourth knob to select the engine type. The filter is a switchable multi-mode low pass, band pass and high pass filter with cutoff and resonance. The entire synth is digital except the filter, which is analog, though it is digitally controlled, so its settings are saved along with everything else in each of the presets. In terms of modulation sources, Microfreak has a six shape LFO, four motion sequencing lanes, and two envelopes, a regular ADSR envelope with a shared decay and release control, and another multi-stage envelope with slope and looping controls, so it can also behave like an LFO as well as go into audio rates. There's a mod matrix on the top left with five mod sources and seven destinations, four destinations are fixed, and three are assignable to pretty much any knob on this panel. There's this icon strip, which controls and randomizes the arpeggiator and sequences, as well as does pitch bends. And finally, on the bottom is this two octave capacitive touch keyboard, which is velocity and pressure sensitive with polyphonic aftertouch, more on this later. On the back panel are two 3.5 millimeter MIDI in and outs, which you can convert to a regular five pin MIDI with an extender like this. You can connect an external keyboard to this if you want to control it with a regular keyboard and you can send MIDI out if you wanna use Microfreak as a controller for external devices, which is quite interesting considering it's polyphonic aftertouch. It also has analog CV gate and pressure outputs as well as clock sync in and out. There's no USB audio, but you can power it with USB as I'm doing now and send MIDI in and out, as well as use Arturia's control software to change internal parameters or offload or onload presets. Because it's all digitally controlled, you can indeed save and load presets on it. It comes with 160 factory presets and there are a total of 256 slots on board. Okay, let's dive into the sound engines. Like I said before, Microfreak has 12 different oscillator engines, including virtual analog, FM, wavetable, formant, additive, a West Coast style complex oscillator engine, and more. Once you've selected the overall sound engine, the engine's name appears on the top of the screen, and then as you change one of its three parameters, you can see what you're changing over here on the bottom. Let's go through these very quickly. The first engine is basic waves. I'll zero all the parameters. This starts with a square wave and then morphs into a sawtooth. is your pulse width and shape adds a sub oscillator.
Now we'll get into the mod matrix later, but you can of course take an LFO and assign it to the timbre parameter and get a nice rich pulse width modulation for all the shapes, by the way. So that's the basic wave engines. The next one up is the super wave or super saw. I've got the modulation here. Let's just reduce it for a second so you can hear the, um, the basic wave. You can erase the modulation by the way, like this. So these are the basic super wave shapes. And then they've actually got their own modulation and detune. So this is the amount of detuning, and then the volume. Right, and the different shapes. while we're here on this super saw. Let's take a listen to the filter. filter later. The next engine is the wavetable engine. So there are a few different wavetables here. And you can obviously move through the position on the wavetable. Morph between the different sets. And you've got a chorus effect. Now, rather than me cycling through these wavetables manually, let's get an LFO to do it for us. I'll take this to timbre as well, and just increase. Maybe slow it down a bit. So really nice sounds, and I'm not applying any effects here. You can imagine this with a reverb on top. Let's check out a few different tables. This one is particularly nice, I think. Notice how we cycle through the wavetable. Nice. Let's check out a few more. Oops, sorry. So that's the wavetable sound engine, and there are 16 tables in it in total. Nice stuff. Next up is the harmonic oscillator. And I've still got my LFO going on timbre. Timbre morphs between sine and triangle and shape adds chorus. All these sounds, by the way, like I mentioned before, can be played polyphonically. And of course, filtered. The next engine up is the Carplus Strong engine. 
So what this does is it recreates the physical characteristics of an instrument digitally with parameters like bow position, I'll just disable the LFO, how hard the resonator is struck, and the decay of the resonator. So obviously there's a lot to play with between these three parameters. So that's the Carplus Strong Engine. Next up, Virtual Analog is an emulation of a two oscillator analog synth. Wave sets the detuning distance between the two oscillators. You can set this to chords or any other interval you want. Timbre controls the shape of the second oscillator and uh, goes all the way through a really nice hard sync. And then shape goes through a, a bunch of shapes between saw, square, and triangle. Next up is Wave Shaper. I like this one. This is sort of like a West Coast style. Wave Shaper and Wave Folder. Super cool. Sounds really good in my opinion. And again, truly enhanced by effects. You take these harmonics and you feed them into a either subtle or not subtle reverb. Now, obviously, you don't want to be turning these knobs by hand. Uh, we'll get to modulation, like I said, in a bit. Next engine is a simple FM engine, two operators. To get FM style sounds, you control the ratio and the amount. You can tone this down or not. And then this controls feedback, which, uh, messes things up a bit, especially. This is, by the way, an example of what I mentioned before, that you can add and increase harmonics without even touching the filter. But of course, it's always nice to add it, right? Next up is the Formant Engine. Obviously, we'll need to open up the filter to hear this. So you can see the way this works. You've got these two frequencies here. This moves them both up and down to create different formants. This is the distance between them. Create different vowel sounds like this. And shape sets the formant width and shape. Okay, let's move on. The chords engine is quite nice. You can select between a bunch of different chord types. And then you've got control over inversions or transpositions. This is with one note, by the way, so change the waveform to maybe something more subtle. Right, so you can actually play chords with chords in the paraphonic mode.
next up is the speech engine. Now, this one's a little bit odd. So it starts with formants, but then as you move up the types, you get into different word banks. So this, for example, is a word bank with colors. And then the timbre changes the type of uh, form and shift. And again, all these parameters can be modulated. So for example, if I want to apply uh, a random LFO to the word, and I need to assign a new mod matrix slot for that, then take the LFO and apply it to it. Let's say do this. Violet. 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 And then give the LFO some space to move. Green. 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 Maybe change its rate. Green. Green. Blue. Indigo. Red. Indigo. Green. Indigo. Indigo. Yellow. Now we can change the the word bank, of course. So let's maybe go for. Indigo. Or four. Six. Numbers. Three. Eight. Seven, six, five, seven, one, seven, four. Now you can't add your own words here. These are just uh, predefined banks of words, six, but four, you can cycle through five, them. One, three, seven, S, K, Q, J, Numbers, H, words, J, letters. H, e, R, Q, Delta, so you might be able to modulate Delta, your way into some funky Delta, sentences. Frequency, clock, operating machine, filter. Okay, let's erase this LFO and move on to the modal resonator. So this is another form of physical modeling, mimicking the way objects resonate when you strike them. Wave determines the amount of inharmonicity, and timbre controls the excitation brightness. shape controls damping. So this way the sounds are more damped, like you dampen them with your hand, and then as you open this up, they ring more. So really nice for creating bell um, or other resonating type sounds. So those are the 12 different sound engines currently in Microfreak. Let's take a look at the filter. It's a uh, multi-mode filter, low pass filters, the high frequencies above the cutoff point. It has a 12 dB per octave slope. Resonance emphasizes the frequencies at the cutoff point. will filter the frequencies above and below the cutoff. Again, 12 dB per octave slope. High pass filters the frequencies below the cutoff point. And that's pretty much it. Um, it will scream if you want it to. It's a much gentler filter than what we're used to with our tools, Steiner Parker filters. For those of you who just want uh, sweeps over a simple saw, so this is the basic. There are plenty of mod sources, by the way, for the filter in the mod matrix, as well as a dedicated filter amount knob in the um, in the main envelope. So if you want to see the punchiness of the envelopes here on the filter, 
So those were the sound engines and the filter. Now let's talk about the keyboard or the touch surface. Now this is obviously a big departure from everything Arturia has done so far and pretty much everyone else and seems like a clear nod to the controls on the Buchla easel. The touch surface is literally a printed circuit board where your hands complete the circuit. So don't count on playing this with your gloves on. And if we get rid of this thing for a bit. So the, um, the surface is extremely sensitive for the lightest touch, there are little ridges between the notes and the black notes are on a different board slightly higher than the white notes and that makes sure that you don't sort of hit the, the white keys by mistake when you're hitting the black keys and you can play on it quite fast. I think way faster than on a regular keyboard, but it's very different. You're not going to be able to play on it like you're used to on a regular keyboard, but you might discover new ways of playing that you just can't on what you're used to. The biggest difference, I think, between this and a regular keyboard actually isn't the lack of travel, but rather the fact that you can't rest your fingers on the keyboard without playing a note, and that takes a little bit of getting used to. You can set the keyboard to respond to either velocity or aftertouch, but not both. And that's done on a per preset basis. And velocity sensitivity works. It works nicely, but less expressive than a regular keyboard. So that was velocity. And then pressure or aftertouch doesn't actually work by the amount of pressure you apply. Right, so it doesn't sense that. It senses the amount of skin that, it, that touches the key bed. Right, so here I'm cycling through a wavetable using aftertouch, applying pressure to timbre on the mod matrix. So that too is different and takes getting used to. The advantage that the Micro Freak has is that aftertouch is polyphonic, so I can control timbre on this note independently of this note. Right, and you do that, like I said, by controlling the amount of skin that touches the keys. So yeah, this is quite different for sure. You can always connect a regular external keyboard to it if you like, and who knows if there's enough demand, maybe Arturia will consider making a micro freak with a regular keyboard. One final note about the keyboard, as the manual says, for it to be fully functional, micro freak must be properly grounded, and they recommend that you use the three pin wall plug that they provide when you buy micro freak. Now during this entire video, I've been using a power bank pretty much like this. The battery just ran out, so I switched it but it works quite well with stuff like this. The only thing that I noticed where uh, there are some glitches is in the pitch bend. So if I hit a note and then use the pitch bend, you can see this sort of little glitch. And if I do some live testing and connect it to a power supply. So when I hook Microfreak up to grounded power, you can see that the pitch bend works super flawlessly. So that's the only issue that I encountered. If you encounter any others, then just use grounded power. All right, let's move on and take a look at the mod matrix and the onboard modulation sources. These are basically our little robots that turn knobs for us. There are nine modulation sources in Microfreak, five sources you can see on the mod matrix here. So the cycling envelope, the regular or VCA envelope, the LFO, the pressure or aftertouch that we saw before, and the keyboard. You can use this as a mod source, say, to control the filter tracking. And then you have four more motion sequencing lanes in the sequencer. We'll get to that later. Let's start with the basics. The main envelope or VCA envelope has a quick routing to the VCA. You can control, obviously, attack, and then sustain, which is a level, and decay. The decay knob controls both the release as well as the decay. So both the stage, the time it takes to go from the peak level to the sustain level, and the time it takes for the sound to decay down. 
Now this envelope can be used to modulate anything, not just how the VCA opens and closes, and you can disconnect it from the VCA completely. So now the keyboard controls whether you hear a sound or not, basically on off for the VCA, and we can use this envelope for something else. There's a default routing to the filter cutoff. Notice the mod matrix as I turn this knob, it lights up to show that the VCA envelope is controlling the cutoff now. Now this knob is bipolar, so if we go back to the decay example that I showed you before, right. this is a quick decay envelope starting high and going down, so this is a positive modulation or positive uh, mod amount to the filter. And then I can go the other way around with negative modulation, right? So that's the main envelope or the VCA envelope, which you can disconnect from the VCA route to the filter or to any one of the destinations in the mod matrix. We'll talk about this in just a second, but let's cover the other mod sources here. The cycling envelope is another modulation source at your disposal. It isn't routed to anything by default. The best way to demonstrate this, I think, it, though slightly annoying, is if we modulate pitch. So hopefully you'll forgive me in the name of science. So let's clear this first so that we, this doesn't interfere. And then we'll go into the mod matrix choose the cycling envelope and route it to pitch and then set the mod amount so that we can hear it. So the basic mode for this envelope is envelope mode and it behaves just like this one, right? So we can have, um, in this case, positive modulation, rise or attack, and uh, decay. And we can add sustain as well. So now it's a four stage envelope. We need to turn on the VCA envelope so we can hear the release. And the nifty thing about uh, this envelope is that you have an amount control here as well. So you don't need to dive into the mod matrix to bring this in and take it out. Now aside from being a regular envelope, the cycling envelope can obviously also cycle. In this case, the sustain parameter isn't relevant Right? And it becomes a hold parameter, which is a time delay or a time difference between the end of the attack and the beginning of the decay. And they're called rise and fall here. And the difference between um, envelope and loop mode is that this, in envelope mode, it's just free running. And in loop mode, it will re-trigger for every key you press. Right? So you can hear the re-trigger, and here, it doesn't re-trigger. The cycling envelope just runs freely, and you catch it wherever it's at. The final cool thing about the cycling envelope is that it has slope controls. Using the shift key, and it goes from exponential to logarithmic. You can hear the difference between the two. So those are the two envelopes. Let's erase this modulation, move on to the LFO and apply that to pitch just so we can hear what's going on. We saw before, there are six shapes. You can control the speed, which can be either synced to the tempo or not. Goes up to 100 hertz. And there are different shapes. The LFO, by the way, isn't polyphonic, so in that regard, uh, the paraphonic moniker is correct. Right? All the voices will move together regardless of when they're triggered. So those are the envelopes and the LFOs. Let's just finish talking about the mod matrix. I think what Arturia have done really nicely here is copy the same idea that they used in the matrix boot, which is to clearly lay out whatever is going on with LEDs on the matrix itself. You saw the mod sources and the preset four destinations. There are three additional destinations that you could set simply by just holding the button and turning the knob that you want to assign 
the uh, slot two. So now slot number one controls the oscillator shape. Now, the reason this is so cool, if I go to one of the factory presets, let's just choose the, choose the first one. There's sort of a lot going on here. The nice thing is that you can see what's going on in the mod matrix. So we've got an envelope affecting pitch. Right, that's that little thing you hear in the beginning. We've got an LFO affecting assignable parameters one and two, which are the fall time and VCO3 parameter, the shape parameter. We know pressure is active. Right, and the, it's affecting the cutoff. And this is also uh, key tracked based on the parameter that we see here. So really nice way to very quickly find out what's going on in a patch and learn how Microfreak works. Let's go back to an init preset. And like you saw before, creating a new modulation spot in the matrix is really easy. Assigning destinations is quite easy. You just select the point on the grid you want to change. You press the button and then choose depth, which can be either positive or negative. Now, one final cool thing about the mod matrix, every mod matrix slot can also be a modulation destination. So let me explain. Let's say, for example, that I assign an LFO to pitch to create vibrato. So I'll take this spot here. And then... All right, so we've got <laughs> gentle or not gentle vibrato. Now I want that vibrato to either start or stop or evolve as the sound moves forward. I could take a mod matrix slot, let's say assign number one, and then assign that to the LFO. And now if I go ahead and choose, let's say the cycling envelope, and increase that a bit. So now, You can hear the vibrato change over time. And I could make it say work like this. So now we've got the cycling envelope controlling the depth of the LFO modulation. Okay, let's move on and talk about the arpeggiator and sequencer, how they relate to this icon strip. Let's start with the arpeggiator. So it starts out pretty simple. This button turns on the arpeggiator. Basic arpeggiation mode is up and right. You've got a simple arpeggiator. Where it starts to get interesting is in the different arpeggiator modes. And we can hold the arpeggiator, by the way, if we want. So we can mess around with any parameter or whatever. Anyway, so up is the basic uh, arpeggiation mode order. We'll play the arpeggio based on the order of the keys pressed. Random will constantly randomize the notes. And then what pattern does is quite interesting. It'll take the pattern that you that you play and randomize it once for every time that you play. Now the length of the pattern it generates is determined in the uh, in the menu in the menu here. So you can set it to any sequence length between four notes to up to sixty four notes. Keep it at, uh, say, 8 for now. So every time I press the keys again, the pattern will change, but it will stay fixed after that. Right? Now, if I like a pattern, I can store it to the sequencer, to either uh, sequencer lane A or B, by holding Shift and pressing here. And now it becomes a programmed sequence that I can go ahead and edit. We'll talk about that in a bit. I don't want to jump ahead. I want to talk a little bit more about the arpeggiator. You can set the octave ranges for it. Right. And you can set its rate, which is either based on time divisions. And you can just set a tempo as well for the, for the entire system, of course. And using the shift parameter, you can also control swing. Right, so that's the arpeggiator. Now let's talk about the splice and dice parameters. 
So maybe I'll choose a simpler pattern. Right? Now, what Splice and Dice do is add increasing randomness. It starts out with different triggers, different rhythms, and then ultimately it adds additional notes or changes the notes slightly, especially as we introduce dice or basically roll the dice on the pattern. You don't need to swipe, by the way, just tap anywhere and it will roll the dice again. So the spicier you've got this set, the more the pattern will evolve. And if you want to despice it, just move it all the way down and you'll have the original pattern that you played. So these pattern and splice and dice parameters are really interesting ways to take a certain melodic idea that you have in your head and mess around with it and create random variations on it that aren't too far away from where you started, but are real generative in nature. Now, splice and dice also apply to the sequencer. Let's talk about that. You activate the sequencer by holding shift and this button. Uh, the ARP or sequencer button turns blue to indicate that you're in sequencer mode. And then these five buttons have a different functionality as is labeled here in the orange labels on the bottom and on the bottom right. The sequence length is determined here like we did before. So remember these icons apply to the sequencer. This little record button will let you record a sequence. And then I can play it back. Okay. So step sequencing is one way of sequencing. I can also just record live over the sequence. And the sequencer is polyphonic too. So if I hit record again, uh, as long as I'm in, on, in paraphonic mode, okay. now I do want a longer sequence here. So let me get this back into Let's say 16 is fine. So let's record a simple sequence. Notice the screen shows you what notes you're recording. So a few more things about sequences. You can play on top of them, right? And if the sequencer isn't running, then it will transpose based on the note you hit. Right? And if you want it to transpose while it's running, just hold shift and hit the, the way you want to transpose it. Now, if the sequencer isn't running and you hit record, you can step through the different steps in the sequence and edit them. So let's say I wanted this step to be this. You can see the two notes and then this step to be this and this step to be this. Right, that now becomes my sequence. Transpose it back. Oh, pretty cool. So that's basic sequencing and you can apply rests and ties as well. But one of the interesting features here is that you have four motion sequencing lanes to control quite a few parameters on the panel as well. To motion sequence a parameter, all you need to do is, while the sequence is playing, hit record and then Turn the knob and we've now created a motion sequence. You can see this little LED lit up to indicate that one of the four lanes is taken. I can now take another parameter and motion sequence that. So let's say resonance, right? So now we're motion sequencing two parameters in two of the four available lanes. Now you can also step sequence motion sequencing. So if you hit record when the pattern isn't playing, you can see in this case, the resonance level on a per step basis. And then you can change lanes by hitting this button, right? So now we've got the filter cutoff frequency on a per step basis. And you know, we can change it on a per step basis as well. And as the sequence plays, um, you can either smooth the parameters or just have them jump from one step to the other and you determine that in the preset settings. You've got sequence parameter smoothing for each of the separate lines. Let's move on to a few miscellaneous features. As you move through the presets, 
The nub positions obviously don't reflect their position in the preset. If you hit the panel button, then that happens, right? Then you're on your own to get back to the presets, obviously. That's very different. So, bottom line, if you want the knobs to reflect the actual parameter positions, press the panel button. Beyond that, as we briefly saw before, there are quite a few features here in the utility menu, both for the preset itself, as well as just general settings. I'll go through these quickly and you can slow down the video if you want to check them out, but don't be surprised if I sound drunk in slow motion. Arturia also offers companion software for preset management and controlling device settings, which is a really nice bonus. Okay, let's talk about some pros and cons. I'll start with the cons and first talk about the hardware. There's no external audio input, which is a shame because the filter is really nice and it would have been great to use the sequencer along with other gear and feed that into the filter. There are no onboard effects. A delay and reverb as per any synth would have been really nice. So when you compare the sounds of Microfreak in this video and in the uh, overall preset video that I did a little bit earlier, think of how they would sound with effects Quite a few synths are coming out with delays, reverbs, and choruses, which add a lot to the sound of the synth, and this is no exception. Regarding the keyboard, while this is certainly usable and with practice is something you can definitely play, if Arturia were to issue a regular keyboard edition of the Micro Freak, I'd probably choose that. I personally love the Keystep keyboard, and I think if there was a version of this with the Keystep keys, with aftertouch, though not polyphonic, it would be killer. Another thing that I don't think is a con, but is more of sort of like a wish list feature, I wish that you could play the four different engines multi timbrally either layer them or control them through separate MIDI channels. One more thing that I think would be cool, so this has glide, right? And it works really nicely in monophonic mode. If you move into paraphonic mode, you maybe choose a longer glide. It works nicely, but sometimes, see, notes will sort of not glide the way that I would expect them to. It would be nice if it would sort of somehow with AI or whatever, uh, detect the, the closest possible note and glide to that, rather than maybe sometimes stealing from a different note and gliding across the keyboard. You can, however, use this to, and trust me, I'm going somewhere with this, make a sort of, check style effect. On the pro side, frankly, I struggle to think of a synth that provides as many synthesis engines and sequencing value as Microfreak at this price range. The large number of sound engine types to have four of them, the SEM filter and the clearly laid out mod matrix, as well as the randomization features here, which I think are really cool and interesting from a generative perspective, all that for $300 makes this a synth that's very hard to ignore. If you want to learn more about synthesis, check out my book available to people who support this channel on Patreon. Feel free to ask me any questions in the comment section below. Hit like if this was useful and ring the YouTube bell to make sure you don't miss the next one. Thanks very much for watching.